Всем привет! Вы смотрите вторую часть интервью с Дэном Эбнетом. Это Варп Маяк и Let the Battle Begin. Hi, Dan, and uh, I welcome you today at, at Warp Mayak for the second part of our uh, interview. Uh, well, thank you very much. Very good to be here again. Okay, so um, how are you doing, Dan? I'm doing very well, thank you. Very, very busy week since we last spoke, but, uh, but uh, yes, furiously writing away on... Uh, It's, it's Horus Heresy today. That's what I'm spending my time on today. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to start with something uh, a bit private uh, this session. Uh, a lot of people uh, heard rumors or maybe read somewhere some, some news and uh, are now in a heated argument online about the state of your health. What disease has struck you and uh, how are you managing with it? Okay. Well, about three years ago, uh, I uh, I suffered a series of uh, of grand mal seizures, uh, and uh, which was scary, obviously. Yeah. And uh, and I uh, was it was it took them several months to work out what was going on. So I had CAT scans and MRI scans and stuff like that. But eventually, they 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 realised that the diagnosis was was epilepsy. I uh, I I was suffering from epilepsy, um, which was. Uh, a surprise because you know I'm 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 not young and I hadn't didn't realize I you know it seems a strange thing to come in uh, or yeah. suddenly hit your life yeah. uh, when you're in your 40s but but there you go apparently it's something I may have all, always had but only ever had in my sleep so I didn't know I was having the fits they gave me once but once it well, the thing is once it was diagnosed they gave me medication we got the medication at the right level and I'm fine I you know I've, I've made a, I've made a great recovery and so it is, it is a condition that I live with but it is one that is entirely managed okay. um, and uh, uh, there were some minor, minor uh, drawbacks, like I couldn't drive a car for 18 months and that kind of stuff. And I had to, I had to watch my health and become uh, become aware of stress levels and tiredness and that yeah. kind of stuff. But those are all those are all actually quite good things to pay attention to. Yeah, obviously. So, so uh, you know, it, 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 and also it was a very once I got over the scary part of it, it was a very interesting experience, which I think has uh, has informed some of my storylines. Um, uh, people have pointed out things that happened in Embedded and Prospero Burns may have something to do with an altered mental state. And I think there have been other rumours more recently that I might be might be ill. Uh, I, because I cleaned my life up quite a lot because of the epilepsy and I, I sort of became more healthily and slept better, I lost a lot of weight. So I think that might be where the other rumours about me having something much worse are coming from because I suddenly lost quite a lot of weight and I think that might be it. But thank you for, the, uh, thank you for anybody who's... Uh, Who's expressed concern? It is. It is epilepsy. It's it's manageable, and I'm I'm dealing with it, and um, and, I, and I intend to carry on dealing with it. That's good. That's good, because we do not want you to suffer in any way, because uh, it would uh, stop uh, the good books from coming up, <laughs> and we need those books. So uh, please be healthy, Dad. I'll do my best. Okay. Um, so the next question is: um, You do realize you have a lot of readers all across the globe with uh, your Warhammer literature, so. Uh, and you got a actually a pretty huge um, following in Russia. You know, you yeah. have uh, quite a few readers in Russia. So, what do you know about Russia? What do I know about Russia? Exactly. Goodness me, um, I, I I don't know stuff. I know stuff about Russia. Some of it's probably wrong. Um, uh, and I have to tell you this: Russia is a place I've always wanted to visit. So I, hmm. I hope there will come an opportunity to to come to a Russian. Uh, convention or something. I, I actually, ha unfortunately, had to turn down opportunities to come to both Moscow and St. Petersburg this year because I have prior commitments. But I really want to come to Russia. I find it a fascinating place, and and hopefully I will come and then end up knowing much more about Russia because I've experienced it firsthand. <laughs> okay, okay. So next question. Um, so Dan, uh, uh, you've been working for um, you know for comic companies. Yeah. Uh, that would be Marvel. Yeah, and and I'm not I'm not sure, but this 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 person's implying here. Did you work for Dark Horse? I worked for Marvel, Dark Horse, DC Comics, Boom, IDW. Oh gosh, I can't remember. Just about. I don't think there's a major comic company I haven't worked for once, in somewhere along the line. I've worked worked for just about everybody. And of course, in the UK over here, I, I write on a regular basis and have done for 15 years for 2000 AD, which is the, is yeah. the classic yeah. British weekly yeah. comics. So I, write, I write comics here and... The homeland of Judge Dredd, for example. Absolutely, yes. Okay. yes. I've, I've actually, I've written several Judge Dredd stories, but I write, I write other... Because other, it's an anthology, I write several other strands in there. I've, I've invented several ongoing strips that run alongside Judge Dredd, so... Wow, okay. Um, so then the question is, like, uh, do you ever um, tend to take ideas from your comic books and uh, implement them in Warhammer, or maybe vice versa? Oh, interesting. I, don't, I think everything informs everything, because I work on so many different, in, in so many different universes, you know, the Marvel Universe, the DC Universe, and the universes I've created, the Warhammer Universe. Um, 
there is inevitably a, a sort of cross-pollination, which I think is quite a healthy thing. But at the same time, I've got to be very careful not to take something very Warhammer, for instance, and put it into, into something else or, 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 or import into Warhammer something that shouldn't be there because they've got, they've got their very distinct um, IPs, intellectual pro uh, properties. That yeah. they need, you need to respect those things very carefully. Um, but I do know that sometimes uh, I've had an idea... I've either had an idea for a comic or working on a comic, I had an idea and I've gone, actually, that's not going to work in a comic, but it will work brilliantly in a novel. Mm -hmm. So I'll carry it across to a, to a Warhammer book. Or the alternative, I'll be writing something in Warhammer and I, I think, well, that's a good idea. I well, actually know that would work better somewhere else because it's much more of a comic, much more of a visual thing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I, I sort of ch uh, mix and match. I'll choose, I'll have an idea in the course of doing one thing and think, no, that's better used over here and, 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 and pay, pay it back. But of course, Warhammer is interesting because I've also written Warhammer comics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and and, uh, and indeed, it's uh, it was announced uh, announced uh, earlier, no, late late last year that I'm I'm doing a, a Horus Heresy graphic novel, mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. which um, which is which is looking spectacularly. Neil Roberts, who is the cover artist of the Horus Heresy books, and, and as you know, amazing. Um, he and I are producing a hundred page original graphic novel set during the Horus Heresy. In fact, it, it, it comes out of. Uh, a moment in No No Fear, the Battle of Kalth novel that I wrote. So mm -hmm. the, the, you, 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 you can you can read a, a prose novel, and then at a certain point you can sort of step aside and pick up a graphic novel, and the story will continue in a different direction there. And he, uh, Neil is producing; he's just producing the most amazing, amazing artwork. I can't wait for for people to see uh, see the end result. And that's also really nice because most comic. I mean, when I write for 2000 AD, I write five or six page installments on a weekly basis. So each episode is is structured to fit into five or six pages. And I write for an American company, it tends to be 20 or 22 pages on a monthly basis. So again, you're, 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 the, the pacing of the story is at a different rate. A very, very rare for somebody to say, here's 100 pages. Wow. It's not going to get broken up into anything else. So you can choose the pacing. That's, so, the, so this novel feels like the most enormous movie because, because its yeah. pacing is completely different because it is not going to be appearing in a different format. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, that's allowed... Um, Neil to do some spectacular things. He said he, what he wants the, the graphic novel to feel like is a sort of a, a three or four billion dollar movie. <laughs> in a, in a book you know, that he's got this huge um, special effects budget. So it's we're really really excited about that. Now, like every, every every couple of weeks, we another few pages appear in my Dropbox, and I go, oh look at that! <laughs> wow, this graphic novel about a horse there. See, so if it, if if it picks up after the no no fear, uh, w would it be about the underground war? No, it's not. It's it is. Uh, it's called McCrag's Honor. Uh -huh. and it's about um, uh, Marius Gage, who is the chapter master yeah. of the Ultramarines, on board the McCrag's Honor, the flagship. Mm -hmm. um, in the in the book, at that point, did uh, they fix the windows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Gilliman, Gilliman is Gilliman is off uh, trying to trying to deal with Corferon. Yeah. And Corferon, without spoiling the book, basically makes a break for it in his ship. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, 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 and it makes a run. He knows the battles over mm -hmm. and he makes a run for it. And, and Gilliman can't catch him, and, but get, basically Gilliman instructs Marius Gage away on the flagship. He says, just chase him. Nothing else matters. Bring him down. And this enormous flagship takes off after, after Corferon's ship. And the two of them basically exit the book at that point and go, this is the thus beginning one of the great naval battles of, uh, of, of, of Imperial history. That's the graphic novel. The graphic wow. novel is like the hunt for Red October in, with 40k... Um, Spaceships of immense size doing the most extraordinary things. It's, it, we've got boarding actions. We've got we've got we've got fleet engagements. We've got all sorts of oh, it's amazing, just awesome. amazing. So awesome. um, so yeah, huge navy action, uh, cataphractic terminators, missile. Oh, just brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. Okay, so <laughs> obviously, I mean, since you work on so many different universes, I mean, how the hell do you keep track of all the events? I mean, how do you not get lost or confused? I mean, hey, like, okay, I play 40k and I read uh, fantasy battles books. I I'm not a huge fan of the game itself, but I kind of like the lore and I read bo the books here and there. And sometimes even I get confused in two universes as a player. I mean, as an author, how do you keep track of everything in comic books and Warhammer and, and whatnot? Oh, well, there, there's a number of different techniques, and every now and then I do make a mistake. Every now and then I'll uh, uh, I'll just I'll forget something, uh, or I, my, actually the most common thing is that I will use the wrong invented swear word in the wrong universe. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll use "bet" in a non in a non Warhammer context. Um, but no, I, it, uh, I just basically try and concentrate. I, I think I was saying to you last week. I always, and in fact, you can't see, but my desk in front of me here is covered in notebooks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
that I'm working from at the moment, and, and obviously post-it notes that I write myself, you know, remember this, and I'll stick it to my screen so it happens there in the right place. Um, a, a vast amounts of reference material that I write up and I print out and I keep, so I've got different folders and different files for different projects. Uh, almost every novel gets its own dedicated notebook full of, full of scrapbook and stuff like that, and then I've got you know, nice, handy visual reference yeah, guides yeah, that, I, yeah. that I use for that kind of stuff. And then, and then when things get really complicated, uh, and these weren't here waiting for you. These are literally just coming off my desk because I'm working at them at the moment. This, uh, this, I, I draw myself maps. Wow. I draw myself maps. That's, that's... Can, uh, can, 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 can you lift it higher a bit? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. That's wow. what I'm working from at the moment for uh, Unremembered Empire. Um, mm. I, uh... It, that is a map of the city of McCrag on McCrag during the Horus Heresy. Okay. I'm like using it as my as my sort of theatre for everything that happens in in, in this novel. Uh, and in fact, I did a copy I, I, when I was drawing it up. I realised it was getting really complicated, and I thought, actually, I just I just draw myself a map. So I draw myself a map so I can remember where everything is. And I did a lovely um, I just photocopied it whilst I was doing it, and I and I photocopied because there's a there's overlays. <laughs> so I put a copy of those onto, uh, onto clear plastic, and I did myself one set, and I did another set which I sent to the guys at Black Library so that they've got a copy too wow. for, their, for their archive. So, yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of, sort, of um, uh, sort of secretarial research work just to make sure I keep, keep tabs on I've got, a, I've got a document actually um, on, on, saved on my, uh, on my desktop, which is every ghost... I've ever named in the Gaunt's Ghost series, broken down by squad, what injuries they've had, if they're dead or alive, and, and obviously each book I add to that, so I've got an ongoing inventory of who's there. Because wow. yeah. early on, three or four books in, I started to, I, on a couple of occasions, I um, I used a, I mentioned a ghost, a minor character, but I mentioned one of the soldiers, and realised I'd killed in the book before. And I thought, I can't keep doing that. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to stop mistakes like that happening. Here's a personal question for me. Um, you know, you wrote a lot of books. You, you know, created a bunch of worlds and a bunch of characters, and uh, some of them are truly believable. And obviously, this creates a huge following and fandom for you. And uh, do you uh, feel responsible for what you create because people get, you know, really into it and get involved and uh, they get all um, interested? In, in the universes you create, uh, so do you feel responsible for what you write? Uh, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I take yes, I do. I I take great responsibility for making sure that I don't. I, t I try my absolute best not to not to bring out something that is just just the next book in the series because I need you to write it. Yeah. I know I know that if, particularly the series like Gorms Ghost and that kind of stuff have such a following. People are so waiting for the next bit, but mm -hmm. I want to make sure it's as good as possible. And everything I write, to be perfectly fair, everything I write is. It's because I want to write it too. I'm engaged with it too. I, I like these characters, and, and uh, uh, so I try and do the best possible version. I sort of write to please myself because I figure if I'm happy with the results, yeah. then maybe the readers are too. And it's um, and that usually works. Sometimes, um, sometimes it, I'm taken by surprise. Sometimes I put I put put something in a book thinking the readers are going to love that bit. They're really going to love that bit, and they and they go, yeah, it was okay, but what we like was that bit over there, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, and and sometimes people take to their hearts the minor characters in a really surprising way, and I I, I realise I've ended up I just sort of they tell me that, and I think, oh gosh, I've got to now start looking after that character because mm -hmm. they've got their own sort of fan base, and people get very 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 engaged, very very engaged on 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 at least one occasion. I've uh, I've nearly been hit. At a convention, wow! By a reader who was absolutely so exercised at what I'd done about something, killing a character off. I don't think they would have done, but they were. They they came. They queued up to talk to me, and when I got there, they said, "Is, is this character really dead?" And I said, "Yeah." And you could see that they that was devastating news for them, and they sort of what, 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 what character was that? Who was well, that? The, the classic one is always Bragg. It's always why did you kill Bragg? But, oh. but when, when that first happened, they people sort of couldn't couldn't <laughs> deal with it, and I and and and, and, and I was sort of. And I took that as the most amazing compliment because I thought, if you if you like that character so much that me killing him off in a war book <laughs> matters that much to you, then I think I've done a good job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so, so I, you know, I, I wear that as a badge of honour, really. So if you if you were hit, I mean, it wouldn't be so bad at all. I mean, you know, it would it would be <laughs> like 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 a medal if you would have a black eye. It would be like a medal of honour, you know, getting hit by a reader. Um, okay, so uh, here's a very interesting question. So Dan. 
Are you a chaos follower or a loyalist in, oh. in, inside? Well, uh, uh, oh, difficult, difficult. I think ultimately I would have to say I'm a loyalist, really, mm -hmm. I'm afraid. Ultimately. Uh, Why? There are a number of reasons for that. One is that I think the... Well, see, it's, 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 I think it's really easy to like, like the forces of chaos because they're kind of very cool mm -hmm. and very interesting and quite complicated and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's, quite, it's, it's literally quite easy to get seduced by the dark side. You yeah. know what I mean? mm -hmm. um, whereas, uh, and by comparison, particularly in the Horus Heresy, by comparison, people like the Ultramarines, they, they kind of look kind of square and ordinary by, by comparison to all the cool stuff that's going on elsewhere. And I figure... Um, I figure the most important thing to do is to make is to is to remember how cool they are as well. Uh, and yeah. so I've ended up I think uh, <laughs> 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 I've, uh yeah. So so yeah, that, those guys and, and and so I, I sort of bias towards the um uh, the loyalists. Um obviously I write an Imperial Guard series. I write I've written I'm gonna write two uh, at least two ultramarine Horus Heresy books. I'm looking forward to getting my teeth into the uh, to the uh, Imperial Fists, but and let's not forget it. Let's not forget the the, the the Loyalists have got some pretty cool. I mean, Space Wolves. Hello, uh, yes. White Scars. You know, some very interesting things going on there. And even when I'm writing uh, essentially Loyalist characters in in the Inquisitor books, mm -hmm. they're walking a very fine line. So mm -hmm. um, so yeah, very very interesting chaos. Very interesting. Um, portraying mm -hmm. the way chaos works in a way that is is as credible as possible, but it's actually it is actually a functioning existence rather than just some kind of insanity. It's that, that actually it has it has some sort of culture that goes along with it, which is something I try to do with the, like the blood pact and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but at, at heart, I think yes, I'm I'm a true true servant of the emperor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hmm, interesting. So, because you uh, generally believe that it's the only way for humanity, and... Uh... I, uh, yeah, I think it's the only... I, I think by the time you get to, 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 the, to the year 40,000, you haven't got many choices left. Uh, but then, then again, sometimes it's really interesting to... Uh, again, without, plot spoil, plot, without using plot spoilers, in a book like Legion, when I'm writing about the Alpha Legion, uh, who I consider to be remarkably loyal remarkably loyal even given the way they go they go there for, for loyal reasons so I think there's there's the real interest is exploring that grey area Warhammer Warhammer looks so black and white good guys and bad guys it's as, it's as simple as that and it, it really isn't and, and it's the grey areas that are the really really cool things yeah that's true absolutely so Dan, uh, you are a master of uh, changing characters for example the development of Eisenhorn uh, down to a radical inquisitor. So, uh, how do you think after your books, uh, did Eisenhower really become a heretic, or is he loyal to the emperor and uh, he's walking this uh, fine line between power and uh, damnation? Wow. And, and wow. Uh, excuse me. And he also says, uh, "Thank you very much for Eisenhorn, and uh, you brought me into the universe of 40k." Fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank, well, thank you for that. Um, Eisen Eisenhorn. Um Eisenhorn was written as a trilogy. I can't remember if I, I said this, this last week, but, look, but uh, Eisenhorn was written, always was going to be a trilogy of books. Yeah. Uh, and when I got to the end of the third one, and they're the ones collected together in that, in that lovely omnibus, when I got to the end of the third one, uh, I decided to walk away from the character of Eisenhorn, even though I liked him very much, because he was still current and in play in the game. And I thought, well, it's up to other people. It's not up to me to say what end, how he ends up. It's up to other people to determine that in their own playing experiences. Yeah, yeah. Which is why I switched to his pupil, Ravenor, and wrote what I thought was going to be an ongoing series of books about Ravenor. Mm -hmm. uh, but his story became so enclosed that that became a trilogy too. So we ended up with it. And I thought, wait a minute, this is clearly the pattern of these, the way these things work for, uh, uh, for the Inquisitor books. Um, and I, and I, then I, then I, then I, did, I, I didn't write an inquisitive book for Ages Nation Nation. I don't know whether you've got it out here. Let's see if I can. Let's see if I can find it. I have just over here published Pariah. Can Pariah. you see that? Yeah, yeah, Pariah. Which is the beginning of the third inquisitor, third and final, I think, inquisitor trilogy. So it'll be a trilogy of trilogies. And Pariah is is Ravenel versus Eisenhorn. It goes back to Eisenhorn and begins to explore what has happened to him. Because I figure enough time has gone by now. But it's it's about time we came back and found out what was going on there. So the answer to that question that I was just asked is sort of unfolding right now in this trilogy of books. That uh, that we'll find out where he where he got to, 
what his mindset is now, uh, what his belief system is, whether he's a good guy, whether he's a bad guy. He's certainly perceived as a bad guy. He's certainly perceived as a bad guy because as a guy who long since crossed the line and is very, very dangerous. But, but I don't think if you've read Eisenhorn, you know that at heart there is this enormous strength. Uh, even if he uses the most radical methods, he's doing it for the most loyal reasons. Let's talk about the uh, the Ultramarines movie. You wrote the script for it, and uh, obviously it's the first uh, movie of its kind for the for the universe. And uh, like I remember my own uh, experience, I was really excited because well, first of all, I'm a huge fan of Ultramarines, mm -hmm. and secondly, uh, I mean, hey, it's the first movie about the 40k. It, you know, whatever it is, we got to be happy about it. And it came out. Um, well, I just want to give my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. um, it's very short, it's very narrow, uh, it's, um, I don't know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, well, you know, uh, uh, me, myself, I make content, uh, different kind of content, but I make content, and I know how difficult it is, uh, you know, trying, uh, for the first time, um, doing something new. And uh, I realized what kind of difficulties that movie uh, probably met on its way to the uh, silver screen, but still, um... A lot of people ask the same question over and over again here in our special thread for uh, you, Dan. And um, why is uh, the picture is so narrow? Why is it so short? Um, I mean, we're not trying to offend you in any way. No, 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 absolutely, absolutely. I, I think they've been talk about doing a movie for such a long time, and, and it still it still gets talked about now. And I think I think this this the, the, the guys who made it who were great who were great guys. Mm -hmm. Fantastic team working there, doing their very best to, to produce something that, that fitted the IP. But but um, they you know they're not they weren't James Cameron, they weren't Christopher Nolan, they didn't have a, a vast studio backing and yeah. millions and millions and millions and millions of budget to throw around. Uh, so everything had to be very we had to do it as carefully as possible. And also you've got to bear in mind for absolutely the right reasons, the Games Workshop as a company wanted to make sure their IP was was expressed properly. Yeah, and yeah. this first outing was so so the the sort of brief I was given. And I actually, t t to be fair, although I wrote the script, I had very little control over any of it because it was, you know, it was. I wrote the script, it went off. They did, they did what they got to do. I, I, I got to, I got to to watch some of the voice records. Mm. So I got to see John Hurt and uh, and, and Sean Pertwee and people doing their voice recordings, which was which was a lovely treat. But uh, really, it was just as an observer because my my job was over. Uh, and the, um, uh, it, they, they, I guess they really wanted it to be. Uh, a bit like the experience of opening the, opening the, uh, getting a, getting a copy of Warhammer 40k, opening the box for the first time, and playing a squad-based event tabletop thing to work out how the rules work. Really keep it that simple. Because when they said write a movie, I was going, oh gosh, yeah, I'll have, you know, ten thousand orcs stampeding across the, you know, and we'll have huge battleships and, and all sorts of stuff like that. And they're going, actually, you know, it is animated, but we, it, even so, there's a budget constraint. We can only do a certain amount of stuff. So let's focus on mm -hmm. doing what we're doing. Cleanly and clearly, as an experience, rather than just going going to. And, and again, you, you, I, I, I enjoyed the experience because I learned an enormous amount. Yeah. There, are, there, are, there were things that I thought, oh, I won't do much of that because that's going to be expensive. But I'll do a lot of that because that's going to be cheap. And I got it completely the wrong way. But I think you've got such great atmosphere hmm. that they are proper forty k stuff, and I'm very proud of that. Certainly. You know, certainly. And, and there are other bits where I'm going, oh god, we could have. We could have done that quicker, or we could have done that. We yeah. could change that bit there, and, but you don't know until you make it. And, and yeah. you know, and sort of, yeah. I, I wrote. This, I can't remember how long ago I wrote the script. It's a long time ago. I wrote that script. It took years for it to to be made. Mm. And by the time it was coming along, I was going, God, I'd almost forgotten what I'd done. And 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 I was looking at it and thinking, I wish I'd been sitting in a chair there where they were where they were storyboarding that out because I would have probably done that bit differently or that bit differently or just made suggestions, not 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 to change them change things radically, but just to, just to sort of polish every now and then. Uh, so if we get a chance to do it again, I would enter into it in, uh, with a rather different mindset, and, uh, because I think there are, until we put 40K on screen, we didn't know what 40K looked like on screen. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? Do you know what I mean? And there, are, there, are, there are things that I would have done more of that I think would have been more in the spirit, the atmosphere yeah. of 40K. So it was. A, it was. I think it's entertaining. I think it's. Uh, I think they did a remarkably good job considering the constraints they had, hmm. and and I think we learned a vast amount from it that will it will help us for, for 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 future things. But yeah, it's not perfect. I understand it's not perfect. Here's a bunch of questions from from a single person. He actually wrote like ten questions. I'm not going to ask them all, but some of them are actually really interesting. So um, 
uh, he's asking, uh, what inspired you to create, in his opinion, one of the best books about the Warhammer Fantasy Battles, which is, I'm, I'm not sure, because he's written in Russian, I, I'm, I haven't read the original book, Writers of Death, or Death Writers, or That's something like that. Writers of the Dead. Okay, know. yeah. So, um, what inspired you to write that, yes. and uh, do you plan to write more? Yeah. I mean, that's the one. Do you, do you, do you plan to write more about uh, fantasy battles? I'd love to. I'd love to. The, uh, the, 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 I'm sort of a slight victim of my own success in as much as the people like what I do with 40K so much, mm -hmm. they tend to want me to do more and more and more of that. Um, so finding a window opportunity, and, and indeed, so much so that there are even 40K projects that I have difficulty finding time to do. Uh, the best example of that would be a sequel to Double Eagle. Everyone really wants, seems to want a sequel to Double Eagle, the air combat book. And I've been trying to write that for years. And I haven't got around to it. So finding the time to write uh, more uh, uh, Warhammer is is difficult. We uh, we've, we've had quite a lot of success by by, by working collaboration with, with 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 first Mike Lee and now with the, now now in another collaboration with the Dark Blade stuff, the Dark Elf stuff. That's worked really really well. But I I really would love to write some more um, out and out fantasy stuff that uh, that I can do. And obviously my wife my wife is Nick Vincent, and she and I work together on the Gilead. Mm -hmm. uh, books as well the second one of those is just out now so so i'm not i'm not completely away from from warhammer but but uh, yeah right rise of the dead which is the one that he mentioned mm -hmm. uh, is actually one of my favorite books i loved writing that book um mm. that and that and the ridiculous warhammer pirates one fell cargo which i which was just an enormously enjoyable thing but rise of the dead was great um i sort of researched um polish hazards mm-hmm in a historical sense and then then used that information to to, to, to write about kislev and uh, um, and and it seemed to work really really well. And I would love to uh, do some more. There's, there's two, two things I particularly love to do in terms of Warhammer. One is a sequel to Rise of the Dead that happens sort of 20 years later. Yeah. I'd love to do that. I've got a great idea for that. The other one is I'd I'd love to write a huge, huge Warhammer novel that's about one of the great cities under siege. So it's a bit. So it, it works as a Warhammer equivalent of, say, Titanicus or Necropolis, one of these things where you're you're at loads of different levels with loads of different characters, and it's everything that's going on in the course of one enormous event. Would that uh, be Prague? Hmm? Would that be the city of Prague? Uh, it could be. Yes, it could be. It could be. There, there are several <laughs> several good candidates, but that would be uh, that would be a good one. Yeah. But just just to take that idea and just go. This is a book about where one of the main characters is actually the city uh. and all the people in it and the people trying to get in and the people trying to defend it and everything like that, which I think would be. Uh, Great fun to do. So, so, so my, the simple answer is I'd love to do more Warhammer. I'm I, just desperately trying to find the chances to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, another question. Um, the Burning of Prospero is truly legendary. It's one of your finest books ever written. Uh, but still, um, who would be closer to you? The, the, the Wolf King or the Crimson King? Ah. Uh, well, thank you for the compliment, first of all. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud. Prospero Burns was the first book, incidentally, that I wrote. Uh, in fact, I was, I was, I'd started it when, when the epilepsy struck me. Mm. So it's the book that I was writing during that diagnosis. Mm. And I think all the stuff that Caspar Ka Hauser experiences with his memory losses and all the mental states are definitely, definitely inspired by the own things that I was going through at the time. Mm. Um, and... Uh, I've had some. I've had some of the best feedback ever on that book. Some of the. Some of the people. Uh, so I've had sort of proper scholarly academic papers written about Prospero Burns because of the, some of the things in there, which are, which are, I think is enormously flattering. I've also had some a, a curiously negative feedback on Prospero Burns because some people went, but the battle only takes place in the last fifty pages. Oh, they sort of. I think they sort of expected Prospero Burns to be a battle report. Yeah. <laughs> like like I guess no no fear. I'm going no. The point of Prospero Burns is to show you why the battle happened. Every, you know, you know, that's but, so so anyway, and that, I think that's why I went and then did all, all out action in the in the following one. But uh, but I li I like the sort of um, uh, the, the fractured uh, time timeline of the book and the, and the things that you learn about it. And um, uh, Graham and I were originally going to write the books the other way around. We were, I was originally going to write the Th Thousand Suns, and he was originally going to write the, the Space Wolves side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and we swapped because I I. I was draw I was very much drawn to Magnus, and I thought the, I thought the Thousand Suns were really interesting. So, so by inclination, I guess it was that magical sorceress thing that particularly appealed to me. And the Space Wolves didn't appeal to me at all. I didn't know whether I was going to be able to write them in a way that uh, that I w was going to be convincing, because um, because they're great to play, really mm. great. Don't get me wrong, like orcs, they're great to play. But you take orcs or Space Wolves and try and put them into a, into the uh, serious fiction, there's a danger they'll look silly mm -hmm. because they are a great sort of larger than life thing 
And I eventually said to Graham, no, I tell you what, let me have a go at the Space Force, because I think I need to be convinced by them. And I love that, that, immer that immersing myself in Fenris and the, the culture there. I love doing that, so that's, that's why they're, uh, Space Wolves are appearing again in, in the latest Horus Heresy book I'm writing and that kind of stuff, because I really, really became immensely fond of them. Uh, and, and so, um, so, initial, so I, guess, I guess initially it, it was the Crimson King, but now I'm, I'm more of one of Russ's people. Titanicus is was truly beautiful, um, and Imperius uh, Dictatio is a great comic. So, um, do you have plans on writing about Arvin Hecate? And <laughs> um, maybe we're going to see some some books about him. Is it possible? Uh, that that would be fun. Uh, I think he gets name checked in uh, in. Uh I don't know what it was. I think I may even be one of the early Gaunt books. He gets name checked as being an ancient commander who's still around. Um, I try and I try and put those strand, weave those strands together so that they show up and you you can sort of see reference to another another series there. I certainly want to write more more Titan stuff. I think the Titan Legion in uh, in Titanicus was a great great bunch of characters and great great war machines. And and because that was set during the Sabbat Worlds Crusade, mm. there's no reason that a I can't do another one of those or b they can't show up in the middle of a Gaunt book, which I think would be quite a cool thing to do, is to have the ghosts fighting alongside the, uh, the Titan Legion. I think that would be quite fun. Uh, Hecate would be great to see him. I think he was a, he was a great, great character. Hmm. Okay. Um, right, here's, a, here's a couple of very interesting questions from one of our readers. And, um, okay, first off, is real simple. So would uh, Bikvin and Eisenhorn be rejoined together at the end of the saga? Uh, I think so, yes. As a general rule, when people ask me questions like that, my answer is the same. I don't want to spoil anything, but I never write a character out of a series yeah. without some plan for, at some point, bringing them back. Uh -huh. so in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so, so, yes, it's, it's unlikely that, unless, unless a character is actually dead and gone, and we know they're dead and gone, it's unlikely that they will just fade out. There may be some secret plan involved about where they will return. Hmm, Okay. Um, <laughs> very, very interesting question. Could you please try and uh, show us <laughs> what it looked like to laugh with your face paralyzed as it happened with uh, Gregor Eisenhorn? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was yes. How do you laugh with a paralyzed face? Okay, can you? You got it. You got to show us. You, you wrote about it. We read about it. Now you got to do it. You got to. I, I think. Well, I'm doing it now. You see, I'm laughing my head off, but my face is paralysed, so you can't see. Uh, you can't see it happening. That's that's. But that's the point. He can be laughing on the inside. Mm. He's he was experiencing the humour, and he thinks he's very funny. He's just his face muscles won't won't reflect that when it's uh, when it's uh, uh, it's, it's 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 actually happening. Mm. That, 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 the alternative answer to that is that's one of those occasions where I forgot his face was paralysed, but we won't admit that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm. As um. <laughs> As a writer of 40K, um, to a newcomer uh, of, of the universe, why would you recommend like two or three books uh, to begin uh, your initiation in the 40K lore with? What would you recommend? Oh, goodness me. That's, that's very difficult. Um... Like, if, if that would be, like, to introduce my girlfriend or my... Okay. So, somebody who's not interested in 40K. Like, try, here. I'm trying to think of, trying to think of a, good, a good cross section there. Um, okay, I'll, I'll do the arrogant bit first. I'd recommend Eisenhorn. Oh, okay. I think Eisen, I think Eisenhorn is a great entry-level drug into the 40K universe because it's self-contained. It tells you a lot about the, the, the stuff that happens behind the lines. And I think if you like Eisenhorn, you'll probably like the way the 40K universe works in terms of its atmosphere. I would then recommend, I guess, some of the... Um, uh, well, some of the sort of great linchpin series that if you like you can carry on so I, I definitely recommend Graham's Ultramarine series as you know just like core 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 values space marine action this is what Warhammer's all about it's a great place to start uh, the Ultramarine books are fantastic and, and, it, and it makes you understand what, a, uh, what goes into that and I may I may also then recommend um, I don't know Gaunt's Ghost or Caiaphas came to give you an idea what the Imperial Imperial Guard is in two very different ways but, but yeah. what the Imperial Guard is like um, but I'd also try if, they, if if you if you if you've got their interest by that stage, I'd also try and introduce them to um, the way different writers handle it. So mm -hmm. you know because I think that's another very important thing. Do you, you know, is your favourite version of um, 40k the way I write Imperial Guard or whatever, or is it is it 
Bill King doing his Space Wolves? Is it the Encounter with the Soul Drinkers and stuff like that? Is it is it Aaron Densky Bowden with his? You know, it's 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 you know, once you're in the universe and you, you you you're standing there, try different things to find out which is the which is the voice you you enjoy listening to. Because I think there's there's a big cross section there. We all yeah. do do things. The same but differently. Yeah. I think that's it. But yeah, I think that'd be I, the Ultramarines. Ultramarines, Nice and Horn, and, and A and other just to just to get you started. We're uh, we're going to wrap up here a little. Okay. And um, one 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 more question I have for you. Um, since you know, I guess the well, I hope so. At least the majority of the 40k fans in Russia would be watching this video, uh, and you you have now a chance to address them directly. What would you tell them? I'd say, oh gosh, I'd say hello. <laughs> I'd say uh, uh, it's nice to meet you at a distance, and I hope one day to meet some some of them, as many of you as possible in person. Uh, if I have, if you have read my books and enjoyed them, then thank you very much, and I hope I've entertained you as much as I possibly can, and I will endeavour to keep trying to do that. Uh, and and I am accessible by uh, Facebook, by my website, and by Twitter. Uh, so any questions that you have. Uh, or any suggestions that you want to have, or that kind of stuff. I'm always happy to. I always love to get feedback because because I learn to do. You know, I learn not to do things again, or learn to do things better from from the feedback I get. Uh, and, um, and 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 just sort of thank you for being thank you for being there. You're you're an audience that I've yet to properly meet. Uh, so I love thanks for Sean for this opportunity to to, to meet it. them. You got it. Got uh, it. And and given the number of questions, the fact that you've you've managed in the, the we lined up this interview and you managed to generate enough questions to keep us talking for well over two hours so we had to do it in two sessions uh, I'm immensely flattered by that it suggests that we should do this again absolutely because uh, absolutely I had to I had to cut out like the uh, at least the third of the questions that I actually asked because there were just simply too many so well, if you, you want to we'll come back at Arena so we can come back together in a, a regular you know, regular interval every every couple of months with the next batch of questions I'm quite happy to uh, to have to field them again because it's very nice to be able to talk to people that I don't usually get to talk to directly. So that's yeah. a fantastic opportunity. Yeah. So, hello, Russia. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, спасибо всем, что смотрели Варп Маяк. Это было интервью с Дэном Эбнатом, одним из самых известных писателей Black Library по Warhammer 40 000. Uh, всем спасибо и let the battle begin.